So thank you everyone for being here. Uh, first, I want to make a uh, announcement for Grand Rounds next week. We're trying this new format. It's going to be uh, uh, a clinical case presentation followed by a debate. <clears throat> so next week's going to be the first one of those. Um, Dr. Fow and Gerson are going to be debating whether to stent or bypass a left main lesion. Uh, we still have to come up with a title, so something like Battle of the Giants or something like that. Uh, so uh, I'll send that out. It should be very interesting. And then uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll have another debate that will be uh, focusing on uh, how to do a risk assessment of someone with, uh, with chest pain. And Dr. Uh, Miller and Kurum Nasir are going to be debating that. So that should be very interesting. Um, uh, I know that... Uh, uh, you know, it's always uh, hard to defend nuclear at Yale, so that should be a um, fascinating uh, a debate. So it's actually a huge honor for me to introduce uh, Dr. Perry Wilson. Um, Perry has been a friend and colleague for a while. Uh, he is a local uh, of Connecticut. He grew up in Guilford, went to high school there, then went to Harvard for undergrad, uh, Columbia for med school, and then he was actually uh, with... Uh, Jeff Testani uh, at UPenn for, uh, for uh, residency and for fellowship. <clears throat> Perry's, uh, of, I know few people who know as much about the uh, statistical methodology of uh, epidemiological studies uh, as Perry. He uh, is our go-to person for trying to understand any of the studies that come out. I follow him religiously on his blog, and I've learned more uh, from him uh, on uh, his blog and on MedPage uh, about uh, uh, studies than any book that I've ever read. Uh, and you know, a lot of people talk about big data and medicine and and you know electronic medical records, but there's very few people who are actually doing something about it. And Perry is one of those few people. He's already done. Uh, groundbreaking research in the use of uh, electronic or medical record data. It's published in The Lancet. He's doing studies uh, currently as well, and they're very likely to make a huge impact on the practice of medicine. So, Barry, it's a huge honor for you to um, give uh, grand rounds of cardiology. I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. That was very nice. Thank you all for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today. Before I start, I promised that I would take an opportunity <clears throat> to educate you about the acute kidney injury alerts you might be seeing when you're on the, on the floors now. We try to reach out to physicians uh, to discuss our current randomized trial whenever we can. So this has nothing to, well, this only has a little bit to do with the current talk. But just in case you've seen this, you will start to see it more. Um, we are randomizing patients throughout six hospitals in Yale, 6,000 patients who have acute kidney injury to pop up these alerts or not. And um, you can find out more about it at our website, akistudy.org. But basically, what I just want to show you, um, because we don't have too much time, is the, a, a brief thing about the functionality of this alert. So, so you can add AKI to the problem list. You can open an AKI order set. But the most important thing that I really want to tell physicians, especially if you don't love getting alerts in your face, is that if you click Dismiss, which is what we often do when we see these alerts, and you open the chart again, the alert comes again because it says, oh, you didn't, you didn't see me, okay? But if you agree or disagree that acute kidney injury is present, so it's one extra click, you can agree, you say, oh yeah, this patient has acute kidney injury, or disagree, and you do have to tell us why you disagree, there's a little, a little box opens, you can free text it. Um, then, you can, then accept will light up and you can click accept and you will not see the alert again for at least 48 hours. It only suppresses it for you, not the rest of the team, so you don't have to worry that you're like acknowledging it for everyone. That's it. <laughs> um, we go from department to department talking about this, so I just want to take that opportunity. We'll now move on to, uh, to, to, to Grand Rounds. Um, where I'm going to talk about uh, the application of a marketing, up, uh, marketing algorithm to electronic health record data and what it can do for you and your patients. Um, it, it, it did not escape my attention that today is May Day. It's, it's May 1st. It's International Workers' Day, um, as well as a traditional celebration of spring. And it feels a little bad to be talking about marketing algorithms on International Workers' Day and like how we can sell more product to consumers. But nevertheless, this is America, and here we are. Um, I also wanted to point out that, that May Day, the, 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 the call that people you know, say when their ship is in trouble, is, is 
not related to May 1st. I, was, I found that out uh, when I was looking into this. Um, it's sort of a misappropriation of the French Mayday, like help me. So I thought that was an interesting little uh, piece of uh, information for you guys. And it doesn't have anything to do with it either, but um, it's good to learn something non-medical uh, whenever you can. Okay. So I'm going to talk uh, today about the difference between prognostic and predictive algorithms. Those two words sound very um, synonymous to most people, but by the end of the talk, you'll know that there's a difference between prognostic and predictive, and we'll, um, we'll discuss that. I'm going to talk to you that, about something called uplift modeling, which is this marketing term, um, and, and hopefully convince you that it's not just cool, but actually ethically mandated. Um, I'm going to show some uh, approaches that have given us success, and I'll... I'll uh, demonstrate that using some some real data. Um, so this is a, a a review we got for one of our papers using uplift algorithms on medical data. Uh, reviewer three said, "Why the authors think an extremely convoluted technique developed in marketing should be taken seriously in clinical research, where highly competent statisticians have developed techniques over decades of research, is mind-boggling." <clears throat> so that was a bit of a rough uh, a rough review. Um, but this reviewer did not get to see this talk, and so by the end of this talk, hopefully I'll convince you why this obscure marketing algorithm is useful. Um, so I want to give you a, an example. Um, uh, so imagine with me that we are the marketing department for a diaper company that sells 100,000 diaper boxes per week, and I'm going to ask you to be interactive here, so, so hopefully you've had your coffee. And you know, management is cracking the whip. They want us to sell more diapers. So we launch a coupon campaign. We're going to send out coupons to our mailing list. Those are diapers. That's a coupon, 20% off. Pretty nice. And these are our diaper sales per week. And I've divided pre and post coupon here. And so if we look at that second line in red, how can we assess whether our coupon made any difference? How can we prove to our bosses that this coupon was a good idea? The number's a little higher, right? Diaper sales went up. Is that good enough? The slope is steeper. The a little steeper, right? So this is a typical sort of before and after design of a study. So what's the limitation here? The limitation is that maybe sales were increasing beforehand anyway, right? So as, a, as an astute marketer, what might you do to figure out if coupons help? Yeah, you would randomize it, right? So this happens all the time, in fact. Um, marketers take their mailing list or email list or you know whatever they have and they send coupons or offers to half of them um, and they don't to another half of them and they actually see what the difference on the return is and so that's a randomized trial and that that happens uh, all the time in fact you're probably Facebook has said that if you're on Facebook you're part of 10 randomized trials at any given time you log on they're constantly trying different things to see what they can make you buy and sell okay so this is you're all doing this all the time so we go to the higher ups and we say, our coupon promotion significantly increased sales from $100,000 to $120,000 per week. We did this with a randomized trial. We were very confident. This is the highest tier of evidence, basically. Um, and what do the higher ups say? They, why, why aren't they you know, giving us raises right now? So they always say, wait a second. How much does this cost, <laughs> right? We have to send these coupons out. And, and people are, if they use them, they're, we don't get as much money back, right? We, we're in the business of making money, not selling diapers. Um, a lot of these people are going to buy our product no matter what. If you give them a coupon, that's throwing money out the window. And, and some people might not like getting coupons. They don't like getting things in the mail. And that might actually turn them off from our product. So are we going to send them to everyone? So this leads us into what's known as the marketer's dilemma. Um, and marketers divide uh, the population into four groups. And on the x-axis, you have the likelihood of buying diapers with a coupon, and the y-axis is the likelihood of buying diapers without a coupon. In the upper right-hand corner, you have what they call the sure things. Okay, These are people that are going to buy diapers. This is like, like me. I'm, my youngest is this close to being out of diapers. But for now, I'm a sure thing. With or without a coupon, I'm going to buy diapers. Not very useful to send them a coupon, right? The opposite corner are called the lost causes. Those are people that aren't going to buy a coupon, aren't going to buy diapers no matter what you do. They don't need diapers. It's useless to uh, to target them. In the upper left-hand corner, you have this weird group that are called sleeping dogs. These are people who, if you don't send them a coupon, will buy diapers. But if you do send them a coupon, they won't. And 
businesses are actually pretty afraid of these people. These are the ones that when they get the phone call or the thing in the mail, it kind of turns them off to your whole brand. Maybe it dilutes your brand a little bit. So they're very worried about this. And then here, your sort of undecided voters, they call these people persuadables. This is the goal. These are the key. These are the people that if you don't send them a coupon, they're not going to buy your diaper. But if you do, if you give them that little push over the edge, they buy your diapers. And if you could just send coupons to that group, man, you would, uh, you would make a lot of money. So it struck us early on that this is very similar to medicine. <laughs> and, and the goals are a little bit different, right? In, in, in marketing, the goal is to maximize profit, maximize the dollars you get back. But in medicine, our goals might be something like lives saved or, or MIs avoided or something like that. And in marketing, you know, an intervention would be like a coupon. But in medicine, maybe it's a medication or some other type of intervention. One of the key insights of uplift modeling is that you can make more money by sending less coupons. Um, you, even an effective coupon, if you send it to everyone in the population, will make you less money overall than if you send it to just the right people in the population. So just knowing that you've got an effective coupon or an effective ad is not enough if you want to maximize money. And it's the same with medicine if you want to maximize life saves. Can we save more lives by giving less medication but giving it to the right people? So medicine paralleled marketing up to and including the randomized trial. And then the marketers have now moved ahead. And we have not taken that next step to figure out how to target interventions to the right people, except in some specific cases, which I'll show you. Now, this uh, uh, occurs in politics, too. And I think it, um, we have some data that, uh, that I'll show you from the uh, Obama campaign that, that illustrates this pretty well. Um, the difference. And these terminologies here, lift is how effective is your campaign. The diaper sale rate in the non-coupon group compared to the coupon group, that's the difference there is the lift. But the uplift is upon whom is that coupon most effective. So let me, let me give an example with um, the Obama campaign. So um, they, on the Obama's website, and I believe this is 2008, um, on Obama's website, they had these different buttons. And their goal here was to get you to give the campaign money. Okay? And what you can see is that they donate now, please donate, why donate, donate and get a gift, contribute. They had all these kind of different buttons. And, and they didn't just decide which one to use. They randomized it. And this is the results that they got. So they found that the most effective in terms of the number of clicks the button got was donate and get a gift overall. So this is a randomized trial. It's a five-arm randomized trial. But it's just a randomized trial. And if these guys were physicians like us, they would say, well, Donate and get a gift is the best button. We're going to use donate and get a gift. And we won't use any other buttons. Okay. But then they said, well, wait, let's, let's break this down a little bit. Let's look at the performance among the people who hadn't signed up for our newsletter or anything like that and hadn't contributed before. You're kind of standard user. And, and there you see donate and get a gift works even better. Okay, looking good. But among the people who had signed up for the newsletter but hadn't donated yet, Donate and get a gift didn't work very well at all. In fact, for them, pl uh, please donate. Please donate worked the best. And for those who had previously donated, contribute worked the best. So if you were interested in maximizing how many donations you get, you wouldn't choose donate and get a gift because that's the best one overall. You would show a person, the, someone, the button that is best for them. And indeed, that's what they did. So if you had never signed up, you would see donate and get a gift. If you had already donated, you would see contribute because maybe that feels more meaningful to you. Okay. So this is sort of targeting the right intervention to the right group of people. Now this brings us to the idea of personalized medicine. Speaking of Obama, right? Um, a big personalized medicine initiative begun in the Obama era. It's the concept that treatments and interventions can be tailored to the individual. And, and to date, I think the precision medicine initiative has focused mainly on genetics. And appropriately so. Genetics are very important in terms of determining who's going to respond to what, what therapies. But they're certainly not the end all be all. Um, We've had personalized medicine for a while. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm a little scared of, of showing cardiologists this slide, but <laughs> because you're probably going to tell me that this is not correct anymore. But at one point in time, when we were deciding who to anticoagulate for atrial fibrillation, we would stratify them in some way, right? We'd use a CHAD score that would predict their risk of uh, stroke with atrial fibrillation. We'd have some, some kind of targets. We didn't just give warfarin to everyone. That is a form of personalized medicine. It's a little, it's a little bit rough. 
And I want to point out that what the CHAD score is is a prognostic model. Remember, I was going to tell you the difference between a prognostic and a predictive model. So a prognostic model tells you the likelihood of an outcome. In this case, the outcome is stroke. So this is a prognostically targeted intervention. We give warfarin to the people at highest risk of stroke. Um, but we have some other real uh, pretty amazing successes in terms of personalized medicine, particularly in the world of cancer. So um, a, a great example is the use of Herceptin trastuzumab um, for HER2 positive breast cancer, where you can see um, one of the uh, initial studies that appeared in 2001. And what you see in the Kaplan-Meier curves there is significantly improved survival among people um, uh, who got Herceptin in addition to chemotherapy versus chemotherapy alone. But if you look at table two, what you see is the response rates were entirely driven by people with the HER2 receptor mutation, which is what we would expect. But this is a targeted form of medicine. Now, HER2 is a predictive model or a predictive marker. HER2 predicts your response to therapy, not Necessary, well, we're targeting it because it predicts your response to therapy, not your risk of outcome. Now, I will say that HER2 is associated, mutations are associated with worse outcomes, but that's sort of neither here nor there. For example, estrogen receptor uh, expression on breast cancer is associated with better outcomes, and yet estrogen receptor uh, expression predicts your response to hormonal therapy in breast cancer, right? And so predictive markers say, how are you gonna to respond to this therapy? Prognostic markers say, what are your risk, what's your risk of outcome? And those might go in the same direction, they might go in opposite directions. Um, just to really drive this home, um, colorectal cancer, uh, uh, cetuximab um, uh, was trialed in a population of people with, uh, with colorectal cancer. And what you see on the left are the population of people who have the wild type KRAS. And on the right, the people who have a mutant uh, mutation in, in KRAS. And if you aren't blue, yellow, colorblind, you can see that these Kaplan-Meier curves are completely switched. And so cetuximab is uniquely effective in the patients with the wild type and uniquely ineffective in the patients with the mutant KRAS. And this is really important because if you didn't know that and you just did this trial, you would conclude that cetuximab doesn't work at all, right? It would be a negative trial because about 50% of people have the mutant, 50% have the wild type just worked out that way. So that would be a mistake. You'd throw away this drug that's effective. It's just effective in some people and harmful in other people. And if you could have figured that out, you would have saved this drug. Um, so we have to keep that in mind. So again, the difference between prognostic and predictive, predictive models. So prognostic models, something like the CHADS-2 or the Framingham Risk Score, the Gale model for breast cancer, where you're predicting an outcome. Um, this, you can make these models with just observational data, right? You just you take your big data set of a million people, and you feed in their baseline characteristics, and you see how long they live, and you can build a model. Pretty simple. Um, predictive models, like HER2 status or KRAS mutation status, uh, are trying to show you the likelihood that this patient is going to respond to a certain intervention. And at this point, you can only really make predictive models in the setting of a randomized trial. You have to say who is the, what characteristics are gonna make this patient respond and not respond during this randomized trial. So is this just subgroup analysis? <laughs> um, and, and the answer is in a simple form, yes. Um, so, Subgroup analysis you know, is done all the time. You do this trial, and then you do some subgroup analyses, and sometimes they're pre-specified, and sometimes they're not, and you detect a signal, and maybe you do a new trial. So my example is in New England Journal of Medicine in 2001, we had activated protein C for severe sepsis, um, which suggested that the benefit was really only occurring to patients with septic shock. And so the FDA said, oh, well, you've got to do another trial, but this time just enroll patients with septic shock, not severe sepsis. And then nine years passed, and we get the septic shock trial, which was negative. So, so this is sort of this, this is what happens in terms of subgroup analysis. You have this huge long waiting period, and oftentimes you don't get um, validation of your subgroups. So uplift modeling is a bit different than subgroup analysis in that you're not dependent on just one or two variables, and it doesn't have to be categorical. So we're actually generating a score, a continuous metric that predicts outcome, and it can predict 
uh, not predicts outcome, that predicts response to therapy. And it can predict that response to therapy using inputs from multiple variables in the patient. So we're not just saying diabetics versus non-diabetics or severe sepsis versus septic shock. We can integrate five, 10, 100, 1,000 variables into these models to predict a, on a continuous level who's going to do well. Um, so one thing I get asked a lot is, shouldn't we just target patients who are at high risk of an outcome? So typical clinical trial design does this all the time, and pharmaceutical companies are very, very worried about this, right? They say, OK, we want a trial, and we're powering our study for a certain, we need a certain number of outcomes. You know, we're going to enroll, I'm in cardiology now, so what do you, you guys do? We're going to enroll 30,000 people. <laughs> and when I, when I talk to nephrologists, I say we're going to enroll 1,000 people. Um, we're going to enroll 30,000 people because uh, you know, we're, we need a, a 500 outcomes or something like that to have enough power to detect a difference. And that's very expensive. And so the pharmaceutical companies and people say, well, let's, let's try to enrich the population for people who are going to experience outcome. Let's enroll higher risk people. We'll get more outcomes and we'll have more power to detect a difference. Well, this assumes that higher risk people benefit more from an intervention. And that is not always true. It is sometimes true, but it's not always true. And if you kind of take it to the logical extremes of risk, you might realize why that's the case, right? So if you take something like statins, um, you might say, oh, statins are probably more effective in people who are at higher risk of heart attack. That seems, that seems pretty reasonable. But that said, if I take that to the extreme end case uh, where there's a 98-year-old uh, with multiple prior MIs on the vent in the CCU or something like that, you know, statins might not be effective in that person. So just targeting high-risk patients is not necessarily the answer. Um, to give a, a perfect example is tamoxifen for, for breast cancer, right? Tamoxifen, patients who are estrogen receptor positive are lower risk than patients who are estrogen receptor negative. So if you gave tamoxifen only to high-risk breast cancer patients, you would completely miss the boat. We should give treatment to those who are likely to benefit from it, not those who are likely to have a bad outcome. And for different treatments, the people that might benefit might be different. Depends on what the intervention is, which is why you need a trial to sort of model this. So why is this important? I told you that this is not just cool, but ethically mandated. So, so this is what I call the biggest secret in medicine. Um, most of the treatments you give a patient will not change his or her outcome. So this is sort of like the depressing part of the talk here. Um, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of give you an example why uh, by illustrating a lottery, okay? So um, we're going to uh, we're gonna play the lottery. Tickets are a dollar. Uh, and the odds of getting a jackpot are one in a thousand, okay? And the jackpot is $2,000. So by, uh, well, we're doing, doing a little math this morning. By a show of hands, who would buy a ticket for this lottery? Gamblers here? This is pretty good, right? The ticket's a dollar. You got one in 1,000 chance, and your jackpot's you know, 2,000 bucks. That's not bad, right? Some people would probably buy more than one ticket. Yeah? Some of you might really you know, buy 1,000 tickets or something. OK, all right. Now, what about this lottery? So the cost per ticket is $10,000. Um, and your odds of jackpot are the same, one in 10,000. The jackpot is $20 million. So exactly the same, same ratio. It's the same decision, right? So everyone. You're still gonna, who's still going to buy a ticket? Bought a ticket before. Still going to buy a ticket. All right. Good. Rolling the dice here, right? So what's the difference? The difference here is that I have a dollar that I am willing to lose, and I don't have ready access to $10,000. So despite the fact that sort of the relative risk of this lottery is the same, and both in a positive direction, that absolute risk is really high. Okay? So... This, again, translates to medicine. So let me talk about this in the terms of the number needed to treat. So this is Sprint, and I don't have to tell you guys about the Sprint data here. Um, but this was a big study looking at intensive blood pressure control versus standard blood pressure control. And you can see uh, the rate of events per year in the intensive versus standard group here. Highly significant. There's a p-value. That's very low p-value and a hazard ratio that looks pretty good, right? Study stopped early. Big headlines. NHLBI shuts it down because intensive blood pressure control is so good. The number needed to treat, something like 185. If you go out, that's over a year. If you go out uh, to five years or so, it gets down to just below 100. So what does that mean? So that means that for that absolute risk reduction, right, you need to treat 
185 people with intensive blood pressure control to prevent one heart attack, one composite cardiovascular outcome. Um, now, I'm not saying that's bad, right? Because it depends what the, uh, what the risk of the intervention is. But we have to acknowledge that most patients in SPRINT were going to do fine, no matter if they were the intensive or the standard arm, right? Most people are just going to be fine. Um, so I feel like this is a conflict of interest, because we have this responsibility to do no harm to our patients, and it's in conflict with our responsibility to benefit society at large. So if we want to benefit society, we should treat everyone with intensive blood pressure control. I'm not here to debate Sprint, <laughs> but let's assume Sprint is true. We should just treat everyone with intensive blood pressure control. But on an individual patient level, if your patient says, Doc, you know, is this extra pill that you're giving me to control my blood pressure going to help me? And you're being honest with them, you would say, well, there's a slight chance it'll help you. It's a, there's about a 1% chance that it'll end up helping you. And, and, but probably not, right? But probably this pill isn't going to make any difference. Um, now, 1% might be, might be fine, right? It, it, this, is, this gets back to our, uh, our lottery we were playing, right? You have this small chance of winning. And if the cost of a ticket, and the win is good, right? I'd rather be alive than have a heart attack. It's a big win. If the cost of the ticket is relatively small, then that's fine. You're willing to pay. If the cost of the ticket is extremely large, you would rather not pay. So how do we fix this ethical conflict? I would say we're ethically obligated to try to figure out who that one person out of the 100 that's going to benefit is as much as we can. right? We'll never figure out exactly who the one in 100 is, but we should try to target our therapies as much as possible. So we expose as few people as possible to the risk while maintaining the benefit. And that's the idea uh, of uplift. So how do we predict the benefit of a drug or intervention? So um, genomics, as I said, is where this has sort of lived so far, right? There's a proven track record. Genes are very easy to measure. I'm a clinical researcher, so I can say that. But basic science people are probably, you know, I don't know. Maybe they're not that easy. It seems easy. It's not very expensive anymore. But you get a result, right? Um, Genes offer a lot of biologic plausibility, right? You have a receptor or a mutation, and the drug targets that particular thing. That's very biological plaus plausible. And you see that in terms of statistical models in the form of single high-potency interacting variables. So you just see like this KRAS mutation with cetuximab. It just blows everything out of the water in terms of the strength of the interaction between that mutation and the effect of the drug. But requires an extra test, right? For now, we don't genotype everyone. Um, a little bit of specialized interpretation. And for many interventions where you're, the drug isn't highly targeted, that might not be enough. Phenomics, which is sort of becoming the term for using big data and electronic health record data, um, is, is widely available, right? All the patients have a ton of data. There's much more data than you think there is. In fact, even missing data is informative in this paradigm, right? If I'm looking at hospitalized patients and I notice that they have, a, they have not had a lactate measured, that tells me something, even though it's not there. Um, no track record whatsoever in terms of doing this. And there are multiple variables that are all weakly interactive. So instead of one big gene mutation that dictates whether you respond to the therapy or not, we've got multiple things that sort of all push you in one direction or the other. Um, and broadly speaking, this is nice. It's, it's, it's essentially free, because this is data that's passively collected. So how do we build these models? So there's some challenges here. Uplift models predict the marginal benefit of an intervention. So you're trying to find that small group of people that are moved from going to have an, out, an event to not going to have an event, those sort of edge cases where the drug really matters. Um, these are subtle. In, with the exception of gene-targeted therapies. And so conventional modeling approaches like logistic regression are often not adequate. And we've had to go to some of the machine learning models that can detect a little more signal in the noise to, uh, to, to, to pull these out. Um, the other issue that we've come across recently is that the models developed in marketing are not designed to do time to event, like Cox models or what we'll typically see in clinical trials where the outcome is you know, time to heart attack. Um, so we've developed some. Uh, my lab has developed some, some ad adaptations of those models that can now integrate time to event, but that's a bit of a challenge. <clears throat> so there's a lot of uh, uplift model diversity. ITE means individualized treatment effect, which is a, a, syn a synonym here. Um, 
Many of them are, I'm just giving you a smattering here, many of them are two equation models where you're essentially, and I'll show you an example of this, you're essentially predicting the likelihood that a patient has an outcome under a condition of treatment and under a condition of no treatment, and you look at the difference between those two predictions, and that's your uplift score. Um, there are also some single equation models. Um, uh, some of these are more machine learning oriented, like a neural network and something called an uplift random forest. Uh, we also use something called a class variable transformation, which um, I won't go into a ton of detail, but it basically involves uh, taking patients who have an outcome, have a bad outcome, and did uh, and were given the intervention and combining them with patients who have a good outcome and weren't given the intervention into one master group and the inverse being another group. So you're, you're sort of finding these people that you did the wrong thing for and the right thing for and comparing them. Um, so let me just show you how it works. I think it's easier to show you how it works. So, so let's take Sprint, because I already talked about Sprint. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so as you all know, this was a big trial, 9,000 patients, uh, intensive versus standard blood pressure control. Um, that shows you the systolic blood pressure achieved in the standard and the intensive arm. So they actually, they did do a good job at reducing blood pressure. Um, no surprises there. And then as you all know, there was a significant benefit seen in terms of cardiovascular events, and the trial was stopped early. Um, there's that very low event right there. I was happy to see that they didn't only, I don't know if you see my mouse, yeah, they didn't only publish uh, the inset here, but the full uh, cumulative hazard, which is nice just to show how small that difference really is. Okay, so just to show you one example of how you would build uplift here, um, we can do a two equation method. And basically what I have here is the prob for each individual patient in Sprint, you have the probability of event um, under the condition that they got standard therapy versus intensive therapy, okay? So for this particular patient, for example, our model, and this is, so we have two prognostic models being built now, right? So we have one that is built under the condition of treatment and one that's built under the condition of control. And we say, okay, your probability of event was 30% if you, uh, if you were uh, in the standard arm, but uh, 20, you know, 28% or something like that if you had been in the intensive arm. So for this patient, we would say, okay, you know, it looks like intensive would be a better choice for you. So in other words, anyone who, this line is unity. So any dot that falls below this line is someone that you would want to give intensive blood pressure control to. And above this line is someone you would not want to give that to. And you can see what they actually got is just colored here, and that should be random because it was a randomized trial. So that's just a random uh, smattering of orange and green. The other thing you want to notice is that more dots fall below the line than above the line. And that makes sense because SPRINT was a positive trial. On average, patients do benefit from intensive blood pressure control, at least within SPRINT. So we would expect more, uh, more patients to be below the line than above the line. So then we can subtract those two predictions for each patient. We can create a histogram here, with, which are our uplift scores. So zero in, the, in this uh, framework is, it's a wash, intensive versus standard, no real benefit. Uh, anything higher than zero is intensive is gonna benefit you, and anything lower than zero is standard would benefit you more on an individual level, and sort of the farther away you are, the, the stronger um, that is. And you can see that the, the hump is a little bit to the right of zero. Because again, in Sprint, more people were benefited from the therapy. Um, we predict more people should benefit from intensive blood pressure control than not benefit. So how does this perform when you sort of target based on that? So what we do, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> I should just tell you that all the models are you know, built in a, a derivation cohort and then validated in a separate held out cohort and whatnot. So, but, so I'm just showing you the test sets here. Um, but uh, so basically what we did just for graphical illustration purposes here is we just split it zero and we said just make two categories people we think should get intensive blood pressure control and people we think shouldn't and this is how sprint looks if you do that so um, we have people expected to benefit from intensive therapy um, here on the left and people predicted not to benefit from intensive therapy on the right so on the left you can see a, uh, a, uh, a pretty good splay in your Kaplan-Meier curves here, and your uh, just pr raw percent of primary outcome um, is shown here. You've got a just under, I think this is about 8% in the standard treatment group compared to five in the intensive treatment group, and those are all statistically significant, whereas in the other group, you basically have overlapping lines and seem to be a wash between who should get 
um, standard and intensive therapy. So this led to a really important question, right? So if we believed this, we would say, don't give everyone intensive blood pressure control, right? Give, give some people <laughs> intensive blood pressure control and some just let them be. But we have to remember that our goal is not to make our Kaplan-Meier curves as wide apart as possible. Our goal is to save lives at the population level. So taken to the extreme, what if I told you that I could find the 1% of patients that have this huge benefit of intensive blood pressure control? That's great for that 1% that I give the huge benefit for, but on a societal level, the more narrow I target, I have to do better in that group to save the same number of lives as targeting a larger group, right? So if I'm gonna target half the population, my intervention has to be twice as good to make it worthwhile in terms of saving lives, okay? So the way you visualize this is something called an uplift curve. Um, and uh, and I, unless any of you have an MBA or something, you probably haven't, haven't seen these before, but it basically looks like this. On the x-axis, we have the percent of the population that's targeted, okay? So if we target everyone in Sprint, that's 100%, we avoid 60 primary outcomes. I think our units here are like over the course of a year. Okay, so that's sort of the, essentially the, the number needed to treat times the people that we, or the people that we're targeting divided by the number needed to treat. So we'd save 60 lives. I'm saying lives, cardiovascular events, I'll just say lives. We'd save 60 lives if we target all 100% of people. And as we go down, targeting fewer and fewer people with our intervention, well, eventually we're gonna get to zero, right? We're gonna, if we target no one, <laughs> we can't save any lives with our intervention. That's intuitive. So this line in the uplift curve represents chance. If you were to randomly target half the population, just, uh, you know, let's say we don't have enough resources or something, and we just say, well, it's a lottery, you flip a coin, you get intensive blood pressure control, then you'd, you know, save half as many lives, basically, right? So the uplift curve sits on top of this line, and we can calculate the area between the uplift curve and the line to tell us how good our model is. And so here's the uplift curve for sprint. Um, so it sits above the line, which is what we'd want. So this tells us, as we sort of go across targeting more narrowly, the total number of lives and the population level that we're saving. So as long as we are at 60 or higher, we are in very good shape, okay? Because we're not paying anything for giving this drug to less people. So all the way over to about targeting 60% of the population. So we get rid of 40% of the people we'd be treating intensive blood pressure control for. We save just as many lives. And then eventually as we target more narrow and more narrow and more narrow, we, 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 we lose that benefit. Um, it is possible for uplift curves to go higher, right? For, for, for uh, interventions that are particularly toxic where you may actually be killing some people by targeting the whole population. As you narrow who you target, that curve can actually go up. And you might find, just like in the diaper example, that you save extra lives by giving the drug to fewer people. But even if this is flat or straight across, we're in very, very good shape. Um, so that's an uplift curve, little. So, so uh, who are these people? I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll go through uh, our results very quickly. So just, as I said, we split our test set at, the, uh, at, at zero uplift, or actually this is the median, but so it's a little, a little higher than zero uplift. But basically, oh no, it's not. No, this is at zero uplift. Um, but you can see that the people who are likely to benefit in this analysis are, are uh, a little bit more female, more often black, a little bit younger, and so on and so forth. As you can see here, um, you want to be a little bit careful about interpreting this um, on an individual basis because, as I said, uplift models integrate multiple factors. And so if you were really using this in clinical practice, you would enter it into some kind of calculator and it would spit out some number for you. But this is the general, um, the general uh, layout. <clears throat> what about negative trials? <laughs> so, um, so our first, uh, my first clinical trial uh, that I got to participate in was one back at the University of Pennsylvania looking at <clears throat> acute kidney injury alerts. It was the pilot study for the study you're all being exposed to right now. Um, and, uh, and basically, oh, we had a, a trial that was a, basically a, a, a stratified randomization trial across medical surgical wards and ICUs um, among patients with acute kidney injury. Uh, and they were just randomized one-to-one -to, -one to alert versus usual care. 
Um, and they, the alert was pretty simple at the time. It wasn't an, a very cool pop-up in Epic like the one that you guys have. It was just a text page um, that said your patient has AKI. Um, and we looked at uh, composite primary outcome at the time of how high your creatinine goes and dialysis and death. Uh, and basically what we showed, if you look at the composite p-value, was, was, was nothing, 0.12. So the, the provision of these alerts didn't meaningfully alter uh, the rates of dialysis death or change in creatinine in this population. Um, I mean, in fact, the trend was a little bit higher uh, in terms of dialysis and death in the alert arm. So we did a lot of hand-wringing hand after that trial and sort of thought about why this didn't work. And um, we thought maybe providers don't care about AKI. They see the thing and, and they dismiss it, right? Um, maybe they already knew their patients had AKI, right? If we, if we send them an alert that they already know, you know, it's not going to make a difference. Um, maybe they didn't know the patient had AKI and they were glad that we told them, but they don't know what to do because we don't have a specific therapy for acute kidney injury. You know, we just sort of do supportive care. Um, but one hypothesis and the one, and the one I'm talking about today is, is it possible that alerts harm some people and benefit others like cetuximab and that we just need to figure out who the right ones to send them to are? And we had a little bit of evidence of this um, because one of our subgroup analyses looked at uh, as I said, it was stratified randomization by medical ward, surgical ward, medical ICU, surgical ICU. On the surgical wards, we found that patients who got alerts uh, were significantly more likely to get a renal consult than patients who didn't get alerts. Which, you know, this is maybe not surprising. I'm married to a surgeon. I, that makes sense to me. Um, uh, this made less sense, which was that patients who got alerts were more likely to receive dialysis than patients who didn't get alerts on the surgical ward service. So subgroup analysis, you know, the p-value here is only 0.02. This isn't adjusted for multiple comparisons. So there are a lot of caveats here. Nevertheless, it raises this question, right? Like when you're a hammer, is all the world a nail? And if, 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 you, um, if you consult nephrology, someone's getting dialyzed. You know, I, I would like to think that's not true, but here's the data. So is it possible that we're harming, that we're harming some people? Um, so here's some raw data from the alert trial. And what I want to show you is those marketing terms, how they would apply here. So let me first uh, put the sure things here. So the sure things are the people who aren't going to have progression of AKI, no matter what you do. These are patients that have a little bump in their creatinine, and they're fine. Whether you send an alert or not, they're going to do fine. Don't worry about it. These are the lost causes, okay? Patients that are going to have progression of AKI no matter what. These are your septic patients on the vent in the ICU. You can send all the alerts you want. They're not going to do very well, okay? We shouldn't be targeting those people. Here are the sleeping dogs, okay? So these are people that will do fine if you don't send an alert, but will do badly if you do send an alert. Right? So these are kind of those surgical ward patients where it would be better if we just hadn't said anything and we didn't have nephrology come and we just let them you know, get discharged and everything would have gone fine. And then here are our you know, persuadables. Right? These are the people that uh, if you sent an alert, they would do great. They wouldn't have progression of AKI. And if you, uh, if you, uh, if you don't send an alert, they are going to have progression of AKI. So this group here are the ones we're targeting. Now, what you'll note that makes this different than the marketer's dilemma that I showed you is that every one of our squares in our epidemiologic table has two of our categories in it instead of just one, which is what makes these models somewhat challenging. So what we end up doing is we create um, we create two broad categories. So we say, these people in green are people you should send an alert to, and these people are the ones you shouldn't send an alert to. And what we're hoping when we model this difference is that because all the undecided voters are in green, and all the sleeping dogs are in red, but the sure things and the lost causes are evenly distributed between those two groups, that we can pick out that signal. That's the class variable transformation. Um, so we, we went through this, and I'll show you the uplift curve for, uh, uh, for this. We just recently published this. So what you can see here, again, if we target everyone with AKI alerts in terms of avoiding primary outcomes, we're actually a little 
below zero, not significantly below zero, but we're a little below zero if we targeted everyone. The alert was ineffective. This is not like Sprint. And if we target no one with alerts, well, we don't save any lives, right? Because we didn't do anything. That's the uplift curve here, okay? So this suggests to us that by targeting fewer people, the right people with AKI alerts, we can actually improve outcomes significantly on a population level. Um, when we looked at our actual data to sort of show that, we, we can confirm we just split our uplift score into five uh, quintiles. And you can see among the group that we would say, oh, we think these people are going to be harmed by alerts. Um, the rate of AKI progression was pretty high in the alert group and not so bad in the usual care group. And you see the reverse of that in the people that are likely to benefit. And then in the middle are all those people who are washed. It doesn't matter if you send an alert or you don't send an alert. Um, we developed something called fish plots, which uh, I, I will uh, skip by uh, briefly, but just showing the outcomes in, um, in the groups in a continuous fashion. And it's just important to see them cross over as you, as you target. But I, I'll skip through that right now. Now, who are these people in terms of the acute kidney injury alerts? Well, this was interesting to us. So the people that benefited, uh, that we predicted would benefit from alerts were uh, older. Uh, they were less often male. They had a low baseline creatinine and a lower randomization creatinine. The SOFA score, in terms of how sick they were, were pretty similar. So this, wasn't, this is not a prognostic score. This is a predictive score. Okay, So this actually made a lot of sense. These are older women with lowish creatinines. These are your frailer, older ladies that when they develop AKI, their creatinine goes from you know, 0.8 to 1.1 or 1.2. It's the very, and it probably does that slowly, right? Because they don't have a lot of muscle mass to to throw creatinine into their volume of distribution. So they have a slow rise in creatinine um, that remains kind of under the recognition threshold for physicians, right? Because it's not three, four, five. Um, that's that group. So it's not the sickest group, actually. The sickest group don't benefit. It's this group that kind of might be flying under the radar. Um, so that made sense from a biologic plausibility perspective, but I should just point out this was, this was data derived, not sort of a priori hypothesis driven. Um, I'll just skip through the mechanism. So, um, so this leads to the idea that, that does tie into the trial we're doing now, which is what if we created a new type of clinical trial um, that used an adaptive design using this type of predictive analytics? And you guys are all in this phase of this clinical trial. Um, so we are uh, randomizing. We're, we're, this is a trial, again, of AKI alert. It's a bit more sophisticated than what we had last time, and it's built in Epic and whatnot. But um, and it's across six hospitals, but we're randomizing 6,030 people. And what I'm showing you here in red is your people that alerts don't matter for, not beneficial. And in blue are the people that it's going to make a difference, right? So in the general population, and this is the group that's being randomized right now, you've got you know, a few people that it's going to matter, but most people it's not. We recognize that. So we're going to run this trial. It's going to take about um, uh, a year and a half to two years. And then we stop, and we build a learning model. We build a, an uplift algorithm. And then we restart, but this time we target, for randomization, we target the people who we believe will see a benefit, who we've learned will see a benefit. And you can see we're now enriching for the blue dots. Um, we're, we're, in fact, maintaining the number of blue dots and, and kicking out red dots, essentially. And we do that. Um, another time to further enrich it. Each trial gets smaller, and as the trial goes on, we learn more and more about who benefits. And the, the advantage to this type of approach is, is twofold. Number one, you send less alerts, and, and that's good for physicians, right? And number two, when you see an alert, you can be more confident that this is a patient you actually need to pay attention to this alert for. Um, this is being done in the context of a clinical trial, but there's no reason that you couldn't do this continuously, actually. A lot of these models can be continuously updated with data. So, um, so if a health system really wanted to dive into this type of approach, um, you could build an intervention um, and continuously over time learn who's benefiting and target just to those people. So this could be particularly useful for a high cost intervention. Let's say you want to send a nurse to every patient's house after their discharge to go through their medicine cabinet and help them take their meds, right? That's expensive to hire those nurses. 
well, let's learn which patient, what characteristics predict the benefit of that intervention. Because it might not be the sickest patient, right? The sickest patient might be getting readmitted to the hospital no matter what. And it might not be the healthiest patient. So that's a place where these uplift models might target your scarce resources very, um, very effectively. Um, so use cases, we can target expensive or toxic therapies. We can re-examine failed trials. So that lesson from cetuximab or from RAKI alert trial that there might be populations that benefit and populations that are harmed within a given clinical trial, especially of heterogeneous uh, conditions. Um, we can create super efficient trials. So instead of enriching prognostically, where we just try to get the sickest patients into our trial, which may not be an effective strategy, we can learn who the best, who the patients are that are most likely to respond to our therapy. And of course, then we can target these limited resources because we have to you know, give them to less people while still maintaining the population benefits. So that's so important. You know, this is not, uh, this isn't death panels, this isn't rationing care. You're actually using less to get the same outcome. Um, there's almost no reason not to do it. And as I said before, I think it's ethically mandated that we do do this kind of thing, or at least attempt to. Um, so uplift modeling is a novel approach to identify individuals who disproportionately benefit from a given intervention. It does require a randomized trial. So those of you who are excited and um, are thinking about your observational data sets, uh, the algorithms at this point sort of fail if randomization doesn't hold. Um, it's a very good way to find out if your randomization is broken, it turns out. Um, but, uh, but for now, it does require a randomized trial. Um, getting variables from the electronic health record um, is a way that we can rapidly target these things. So instead of having your you know, uh, research coordinators manually logging all this data and filling out forms and having patients take surveys, just use the data we have and we can integrate that and make good choices. Um, my, my hope is that hospitals actually do become like Facebook and just like you're all part of 10 clinical trials every time you turn on your phone, our patients can be parts of 10 clinical trials trying to learn what, uh, what, uh, what patients benefit from what hospital level um, and community interventions. So I hope this is what happened when I gave this uh, talk to my kids. Um, <laughs> And, uh, uh, but uh, I, so most of you are still awake, so I appreciate that. Um, obviously, this work uh, uh, was the result of a lot of collaboration. Aditya Biswas is our uh, a computer programmer who has done uh, just a tremendous job. Um, I'd like to thank uh, particularly Stephen Latham, our bioethicist, for uh, helping us with uh, some of the issues regarding waiver of informed consent in the current clinical trial um, and uh, the funding um, listed below. Uh, and... I'm happy to take any questions.